Good afternoon and welcome to our Monday, July 10th City Council briefing session. Uh, Ms. Fister, would you please call the roll? Council, <clears throat> excuse me, Council President Beggs. Here. Council Member Bingle. I'll try the rest. Council Member <clears throat> Cathcart. Present. Council Member Kinnear. Present. Council Member Stratton. Here. <clears throat> Council Member Wilkerson. Present. Council Member Sapone. Here. Council Member Bingle. I see him online, but. Yeah, we'll, we'll have him, maybe somebody can text him. To Sorry, I was, I was okay. muted over here. Okay. Okay, let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right, so we are briefing uh, both tonight's agenda and uh, the agenda for next Monday, which is a town hall meeting mostly. But we're going to start with tonight's agenda so that we can get things um, solidified for people to sign things up. And um, I'm going to turn it over to our acting city administrator, Garrett Jones. Welcome to the dais. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you, Council President. I'm honored to be up here with you on your last Monday briefing. Uh, for consent agenda number one, this is a service level agreement with Spokane Regional Emergency Communications regarding emergency communication services, and this will be briefed by Lyndon Smithson. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, I do have some updates. I spoke with the county on this, a county commissioner, and I did have, I have had some uh, communication with the uh, director for the county. Um, I know that we have contemplated and we have asked that they would put a person on their board. I do not believe that that is the appetite of the county commissioner's office. What they did offer is that we could have, sorry, city council could have a representative on their budget and finance team. I don't know if that is a voting position or not, but they, that person would have uh, an opportunity to be in on the, on the, the budget and we'll hear you know, how the updates are, are going and, and where the money is being used. Um, but that is, that is the best offer that I've gotten from the county commissioners. Yes, Michael. Would, would that individual be permitted to attend executive session meetings? No. I doubt that that, I, I think only board members can attend executive session. My, my concern with that would be that they, I, I just, I don't know how effective that position would be, I mean, I, I think we should have a full voting member, but if you're going to compromise that, I think they at least have to be in every discussion that they have. Well, and I'll remind you, we do have two board members through the city administration. So this is the city council representative um, only. I think that city council is going to have those conversations with our two board members. Absolutely. The city administrator and the fire chief of anything outside of what the uh, finance person knows or, or they've learned. The problem is that communication in the past has been less than ideal. So that's. No, I, I yeah. understand. I, yeah. I'm just bringing to you yep. what the conversations <laughs> I've had with the county. Yep. So, so um, don't, don't line up your arrows quite, <laughs> quite yet. I think this violates the, the ordinance as well, correct? Yeah. Go ahead. Sh uh, sh well, an ordinance that we drafted, and I'm not sure that I have a way to compel them to to uh, comply. A, a lawsuit, I'm not sure that that, that will get us very far. No. Um, conversations that I've had, this is where this is where we're at. If, if anybody has any more ideas, I'm absolutely uh, okay to talk about it offline and we can pursue those avenues. But I think Councilmember Kinnear's point is that we could not enter into this agreement without violating our ordinance as currently written. I, I understand, but we have two options. Okay. Either we, we do our own dispatch or we sign their service level agreement, I guess three options, or we pay the admin fee. So we're I not think paying we the admin fee right now. No, we are not right now, no. Okay. But I'm uh, just saying, I don't think we could approve this today because it would violate our I understand. city code. So. I understand. So I think, I think we now need to have some conversations and, and figure out our, our path forward. Chief, looks like he wants to say something. Yes. Welcome, Chief Schaefer. No, I, I was just here for moral support and to hopefully add the operational piece or the operational perspective to this. If there's a, if there's a communication uh, 
problem between what is occurring now that we're on the board between myself and the city administrator, definitely bring that up. Uh, all of their meetings are public. Any of the city council or your appointee are allowed to go to those. I think we have, just like our executive sessions here, what is it, real, real estate personnel and legal. And so I, with the exception of those three areas, everything else is, is transparent and open. I will just say I, I happen to know for a fact that there have been conversations in exec session regarding pertinent issues that I would want our representative to be a part of. Okay. Uh, let me know. Uh, you know, I've been to one executive session since I've been on the board. Um, but just like yours, those are supposed to be uh, clearly confidential and not supposed to leave the, the sanctity of the process. So that's somewhat surprising. But, you know, I, I know um, for uh, the community, us, us to continue on the month-to-month the -month, um, concept or operation is, uh, is, is troubling to the folks that are on the, in, in the field and on the floor because it's like we've got to step in, but we're really not a point. We're not really a part. We have to be a part of the regional system. For us to operate in a silo is dangerous. It doesn't allow us to uh, manage our resources appropriately. It puts us on a different standard platform and operational tempo as the rest of the county. And like you've seen today, if any of you have seen the weather, you know, we're moving resources across jurisdictional boundaries every every couple minutes. So those things really matter. I just have to say, <clears throat> Lyndon, thank you. <clears throat> I know this was information that you had to deliver, but for those of us that have been here and have watched this proceed, it has never been, um, and I will say my own opinion, an open and transparent process um, and I think there are many people that know and understand that. Um, and I think there are some of us that are just afraid to get caught up in it again and put dollars out there that um, we're not necessarily benefiting from. And if we're worried about staff, we should have worried about staff when we started this whole process because there have been a lot of staff that have been stuck in the middle of this you know, let go out of it, um, didn't have jobs. So I'm not surprised this is happening. And there is some of us that have a little PTSD over this because it's been this way from day one. And everything that's being said, I expect is being said. I expect it to be said, but I don't hold a lot of faith that um, this is an open and transparent process. I just, I just don't. And but, I'm, but I'm glad we're talking about it in public and people can hear our comments. Well, yeah, and, and at this point, I think any, any uh, delays or any uh, challenges right now are, are being self-influenced. We're, we're part of that because we're not all in. Right. And, um, and to me, that, that's not sustained. We can't continue to do that. I, one of the important parts about leadership is not getting stuck on looking at the rearview mirror. We have got to look forward. There's people that rely on the system. So um, as, as a region, people really do look to Spokane to, to lead. So I, um, I just like to be able to move forward, especially for the fire service. I hear you. Um, I don't want to look back either. I want to learn from what happened prior and not get stuck in a position where <clears throat> we're putting money into things that we shouldn't. If we don't have I would caught with if we don't, we're in control of the budget. If we don't have representation on that board, um, the elected body has no rep representation. And yes, we can hear it from you. We can hear it from the city administrator. But to Councilmember Cathcart's point, that makes me very, very nervous. If we're not involved, 100 <clears throat> percent in what what is going on, that's our job. And right. so that, that concerns me. And it also concerns me that the county is not willing to come meet us halfway. Mm -hmm. So what, what is so scary about a council member being on the board? I, I don't understand that. I certainly can't speak for them. I can, I can only tell you that, like, from the beginning, that was designed to be apolitical. 
and they truly, when they set up the, the Shrek board, when it transitioned from 911 to what it was called something before Shrek, I don't even recall, but um, when the, the board was established, it was, they, they specifically did not want electeds to be appointed on that board. The and, sheriff uh, isn't elected though. <clears throat> and they, they carved out an exception as yeah. county commissioners as that leadership position. They carved out because he is, or she, is the number one law enforcement most authoritative uh, position in the county by doctrine, by, by state by state law. So to me, that made sense. And the fact that there are no other electeds on the board, no other council members, uh, districts, any special uh, district elected official on there, it, it made sense. Um, the logic follows. I, I think those are our sideboards. I don't know that we're going to change that because it's not within our purview as a municipality. Yeah. Right. Same thing for Spokane Valley and, and all the other municipalities in the county. But but we weren't asking for an elected. We we compromised on that and said, no, we just need a staff person that represents the policy making and the budget of the city. And, you know, we've been, we've come to them and said, look, we'll have peace on this. We'll move forward. We'll work together. And we asked for this one pretty small thing as a matter of trust to show that we can move forward together in good faith. And so the very fact that they're not willing to do that one thing uh, is troubling. It's not your issue, you didn't cause it, so I'm not saying that. But that, that, that speaks almost more to anything else, that they feel like if our staff member was in an executive session, that that would be somehow dangerous or troubling. Um, but we can't. And I just want to clarify, I, I have not inquired whether or not they would be allowed in in executive session, so don't quote me on that, but I, I don't imagine that, that that would be their position. <clears throat> yeah. Can I, um, my assumption is this will either get deferred again or voted down today, but, and if that's the case, I assume the conversation continues. Uh, if so, I, I, I would be open, I, I'm not speaking for anybody else, just myself, but I would be open to some sort of a board liaison position that just has full participatory rights minus the vote. Right, I, I'd be totally open to that. I think that's a reasonable compromise. I just think there should be somebody who can actually be in those discussions. Yeah. Sure, and, and I, I would appreciate a further conversation with council so I can take that information and, and I understand our position, but. Um, and we've offered that too, just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've made, so I did have a good conversation with Commissioner French a few weeks ago. He said he was open to further discussions about it, so. And that's just my hope is that we keep delaying it. We're not paying the extra fee till we have a conversation where we're trusted enough and they're trusted enough that we can move together. We just haven't quite gotten there. And I don't know if, I mean, I think the best thing would be for you, Lyndon, would be to identify one or more commissioners that one or more council members could talk to, sit down together face to face, because I think Typically what's happening is we're hearing from Scott Simmons and it's not the elected who have to work together on lots of things. We're trying to do regional homeland. We're trying to do all these regional things. So why we wouldn't do this, uh, I'm not sure. But um, I think uh, relations have thawed somewhat across the river lately. So I'd say let's continue to do that. No, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, who would like to be in, included in that? Because I, I will definitely try and set those meetings up. I mean, as, as the public safety chair, I'm happy to be in any Absolutely. of those discussions. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Plus, he has the best relationships with some of those folks. <laughs> That's good. All right. Is there a motion to defer this? I move to defer for how long? Mm. January 28th? 29th? January 29th. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Aye. No. Any abstentions? All right, it's deferred to January 29th. We'll look forward to deploying Councilmember Cathcart. And um, I, again, I am hopeful. We have already gotten over the war, and we're now just trying to put it back together. So I'm hopeful we can do that. Thanks. All right, back to the consent agenda number two and three. We'll be brief by uh, Raylene and Jeanette. Uh, number two is the five-year value blanket with Haska Inc. And then number three is a public works agreement with McKinstry Company, LLC. 
All right, for the first one, this is a five-year value blanket for with Haska. Um, this was the low bidder um, to supply sodium hydro hydrochloride um, as needed basis to the treatment plant. Um, goes through July of 2028 for 100 or one million eight hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. Any questions? And then the third, the number three is uh, Public Works um, agreement to contract with uh, McKinstry. Um, for HVAC repairs at the rip at the treatment plant, um, this will be to replace about a dozen aging, heating, and cooling units throughout the plant. Um, this contract will be through um, May of 2024. Any questions on that? Thank you. All right, thank you, Renee. Number four is a pre-approval of purchase of four to five used vehicles to be used by the police department to fill the gap due to a long lead times, and this will be briefed by Rick Ginnings. Thank you. Good afternoon, <clears throat> City Council. Uh, Fleet's requesting uh, uh, pre-purchase approval for up to five used um, uh, K-8 interceptors for the police department. SPD is currently experiencing uh, severe sh vehicle shortage due to long delays in, in the vehicles, in pr producing the vehicles that we already have ordered. Uh, we still don't have a, a production date for those. And then, then, of course, we just haven't been able to replace the vehicles that have been in accidents or have, have been uh, damage beyond repair over the last couple of years. Uh, so purchasing these used vehicles will allow us to at least partially address the shortage uh, fairly quickly and cost effectively. Uh, cost would be not to exceed $160,000. Councilor Kinnear. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so where are you getting these? There's a lot of places that have them, and of course, we want to get approval before we nail down a, a, a location, but there are other municipalities, other police departments who sell them off uh, kind of faster than we do, and so we can get five-year-old vehicles with 60, 70,000 miles on them uh, from, a, from various places, different auctions, uh, and then there's also uh, like uh, uh, federal organizations that, uh, you know, um, I can't think of the name, uh, GS, or yeah, I can't remember. Anyway, a federal organization sells them off. Uh, and so they're being used for um, unmarked vehicles? Is that right? Some are marked, some are unmarked. Um, we're, we're hoping actually to find some uh, that we can talk to the municipality prior to them decommissioning it so that we don't have to recommission them when they okay. come back into the fleet. That'll save us some money. Okay. We do have parts left over from a lot of the old vehicles okay. uh, so that even if we get them decommissioned, we can put the parts back in them fairly cheap. And is this 160 coming out of the 3 million that we allocated? No, this is, this is um, in fact, Major McNabb, you might be able to tell me there's a, there, there is funding for it uh, in um, uh, seized funds. I can't remember all. Forfeiture funds? Forfeiture funds. Mike, do you, okay. do you have that information? He's got everything. And then the final question is, um, <clears throat> do you have a, Okay, sorry. Major McNabb, go first. Yeah. For you. <laughs> so uh, it's going to come from multiple places. One is the vehicle replacement fund, which is what we get when we auction vehicles that we're getting rid of that has about $60,000 in it. And then we are looking to uh, recoup some of the money we've gotten from vehicles that are uh, totaled through insurance companies. I believe the fire department did that last year. We were looking to do that, and that would be an SBO. Um, and then also... Uh, Maybe looking at some seizure funds to do that as well. Final question. Yes, ma'am. Do you have an inventory list of all the vehicles that police have? Oh, yeah. You do? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. It would be nice <clears throat> to share that because we have no idea if you have 300 or 600 vehicles. We have no idea. Yeah, I've supplied that information multiple times, Councilwoman. Yeah, I can certainly get that to you again. Updated list where they yeah. are, how they're deployed. So that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have anything? Well, Rick answered my part of my question about where were the funds going to come to outfit these vehicles. But if they are, if you can get them before they are decommissioned, because I was concerned about that additional cost and where those funds would come from as well. Yeah, and that that would be the goal. Um, a lot of a lot <laughs> of municipalities will actually sell them. Uh, to other police forces because they're relatively new when they sell them off. We have to find them, and so there's going to be some time involved in that, but we, we're fairly confident we can find some that meet the need and that don't cost too much. 
Councilmember Zappone? Yeah, we did get a very extensive list last year of all of the cars and went in depth about all of their miles and all of that last year. But it has been a year, which is a long time. Um, my question, though, is, is this just four to five additional vehicles then? Because we already ordered a bunch and this is just increasing the number of Well, vehicles? technically, I'm, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Technically, it's not in, increasing the number in the fleet because we've lost so many to vehicles being in accidents and being totaled. And so, so we're really just more or less replacing those vehicles that have gone away uh, that, that, um, that we couldn't replace, uh, you know, over the course of the last couple of years. But your question is all the ones that have we yeah. approved for order, those are still ongoing. Those are still ongoing. But then this is in addition to those. Yeah. But in addition, I'm, yeah, and, and those ones, of course, we don't have a production date. So this is really just to bridge the gap to get some vehicles in, in the hands of police prior to those vehicles yeah. being delivered. Yeah. I remember when we did look at the list last year, there was a pretty large loaner. Like, There's a pretty big fleet there that it didn't seem like we were decommissioning our vehicles very often when we get those new orders, but we were just growing our fleet. And so this sounds like it's continued to just grow. Yeah, so there's a couple of factors that go into that. Number one, when as the fleet ages, there's a lot more of them that are being worked on at any given time. Uh, they become less reliable, so we need more loaners to, to, to meet the need. Uh, police also just changed the way that they're patrolling, which, which requires more officers on the, in vehicles at any given time. So that increased the need by a fair amount. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, so the, the decommissioning, honestly, because we're not sure when the next vehicles are going to show up, we're afraid to get rid of vehicles until we're sure we have a vehicle to replace it with. Any more intelligence than when we might hear about production dates? No, I'm, I'm checking every single day to see. Uh, we see that some of our neighbors have had some scheduled for production, um, so checking every single day. But we're on the Ford website. We are M1, which could be as late as December before they even get on the on the floor. And as we've talked about before, we know that some of these vehicles um, may get canceled, right? So we've had this conversation before. We're hoping that doesn't happen. Well, thank Oh, go yeah, ahead. Councilman. I just want to say thank you, Rick, because it's, the perception is that we're not funding cars. We are funding cars. Cars are just not available. We want our officers to have the right equipment uh, to do their job. So just make that clear to everyone. There is money for it. Just cars aren't being made very quickly. Yeah, yeah, th th that is very true. We, we, of all the vehicles we need right now, we, you know, the vehicles went from being order it and get them in your hand to it may be a year or two years before you get them. So, Thank you. All right. all right. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rick. All right. Thank you, Rick. Uh, number five is the acceptance of the fiscal year 2022 Continuum of Care Program awards from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and approvals to enter into sub-recipient agreements. And this will be briefed by Kimberly Bapp. Good afternoon. Um, as our role as collaborative applicant for the Washington 502 uh, Spokane City County Regional Continuum of Care, we do seek approval to accept the fiscal year 2022 COC program awards from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and approval to enter into sub-recipient uh, agreements with the grantees attached in the briefing paper. Got off easy. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, number six is the recommendation to list the Alex and Fanny Ritter House at 702 West 21st Avenue to the Spokane Register of Historic Places, and that'll be briefed by Megan Duvall online. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this was briefed at our June 12th Urban Experience Committee meeting. Um, the Spokane Historic Landmarks Commission passed it at their June 21st meeting and it passed unanimously. And so uh, we're just recommending uh, that it be listed. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Megan. All right, seven through thank 10 you. will be briefed by Dan Bowler. Uh, number seven is low bid for city, Power City Electric for the Division Pedestrian Hybrid Beacon Project. Number eight will be the low bid for DW excavating for the North East Force Main Project. Number nine will be the low bid of Halmy Construction for the South Gorge Trail Connection Project. And number 10 will be the low bid of W.M. Winkler Company for the Garland Avenue Pathway Shaw Middle School Project. 
Good afternoon, as Garrett just said, item seven, proposed low bid contract with Power City for the division pedestrian hybrid beacons for $1.185 million, to which we propose to add a 10% administrative reserve. Two other bids received, the low bid was about 80,000 or 6% under the engineer's estimate. This project installs Hawk signals at three locations on division, Rhodes and Wiley, Everett and Longfellow. And because of long signal ordering lead times, the majority of the work is expected to be performed in the spring of 2024. Item eight, propose a low bid contract with DW Excavating of Davenport for the Northeast Force Main project for 1.19 million, to which we propose to add a 10% administrative reserve. Two other bids were received on this one as well. Low bid was approximately 44,000 or about 4% above the engineer's estimate. This project constructs a sewer pressure main or force main in the northeast part of Spokane, as shown on the exhibit in your briefing packet, and will be constructed on mostly unpaved roads. Work is expected to start later this summer and can be, and be completed this fall. Uh, item nine, proposed low bid contract with Holmey Construction of Spokane for the South Gorge Trail Project for 2.529 million, to which we propose to add a 10% administrative reserve. One other bid was received. The low bid was approximately 370,000 or 17% above the engineer's estimates. The project constructs a trail connecting the trail you can see hanging on the north side of the CSO tank across the street from the library under the Monroe Street Bridge, then connecting to the existing trail on the north side of Main Avenue in front of the Spokane Club. And this segment fills the final gap in the South Gorge Centennial Trail loop, um, beginning and ending at City Hall, as shown in the exhibit in your briefing packet. Work is expected to start this fall and be completed in the spring of 2024. And then finally, item 10, proposed low bid contract with Winkler Company of Spokane for the Garland Pathway for 1.321 million. Again, proposed 10% administrative reserve. One other bid was received. Low bid was about 184,000 or 12% under the engineer's estimate. The project constructs a shared use trail along the north side of Garland connecting the Children of the Sun Trail being uh, constructed currently as part of the north-south freeway to the new Shaw Middle School, the new, uh, new Tech Skills Center, the Northeast Community Center, and the Hilliard Library, as shown in the exhibit in your briefing paper. Work is expected to start and finish this fall. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, number 11 will be a public works contract with Clearwater Summit Group, and this will be briefed by Lauren Searle. Good afternoon, Council. Number 11 is a contract with Clearwater Summit for landscaping at Indian Trail Tank uh, for a total cost of $82,825. Um, this is actually in conjunction with the purchase agreement back in 1995 that required us to landscape that per the um, housing development that was around it. It's simply taken this long for the housing development to get up that high. So now we're on the hook for landscaping around that tank. Are you using Spokanescape? It is Spokanescape, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right, thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Appreciate it. Number tw uh, 12 is the report of the mayor on pending uh, claims and payments, approved obligations, including those of parks and libraries, and then payroll claims of previously approved obligations. And then 13 is the city council meeting minutes. And that's the end of the consent agenda. So moving on to the legislative uh, agenda and the special budget ordinances. Ordinance uh, C36406 is various funds to make grade and associated pay range changes for various positions. And this will be briefed by Ryan Couch. Good afternoon, Council. The list for this SBO is longer than normal. Uh, as again stated from, from the committee, uh, we did have a delay in working through many of the um, salary reviews. The salary reviews will cover approximately 100 city employees. Uh, and there is a total cost for the remaining year on the low side, uh, 115,000 and the high side, 221,000. Questions that I can address for you. So it covers 100 city employee positions 
or 100 city employees. Okay. So there's 26 salary surveys that right. we completed. Okay. And of those 26 salary surveys, there's a total of 100 employees within those 26 uh, classifications. And are they on various levels from higher directors to clerks and that kind of thing? Or uh, They are, council Councilwoman. Uh, the majority of them are 270 laboring groups. Okay. There are MMPs. Uh, I believe there are only three exempt confidential positions of manager levels. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, the next is five um, SBOs uh, related to budget changes, and uh, presenting those will be Tanya Wallace. So that's Ordinance C3-6409, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Yes, uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, the first one is really the mid-year adjustment to the general fund that we reviewed um, last week. Um, and were carefully reviewed by Council President and Matt Boston on Friday. And so are there any questions on that one? It is quite detailed, so it should align with the presentation that you had last week. The next one is for the Washington Paid Family Medical Leave Act, and Jessica briefed this also last Thursday. This is a, a new state requirement, so we've up and it does affect multiple funds. So this is the SBO that increases those appropriations by fund. The next one is street maintenance, and this involves the revenue REIT 1 and REIT 2. And this is really just a budget correction because it was our first time using Questica and the capital module and how those revenues got reported over into the operations module. So this is just a revenue budget correction. The next one that I'm going to uh, talk about, Ordinance C36412 for salary savings for the interpreter costs. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to ask that you, that we withdraw that and hold that and we'll bring that forward. There's a little bit of confusion on the funding for that. So I am going to request that you withdraw that and we will bring something forward to you at a later time. How, how long do you want us to defer it? <clears throat> Excuse me. How long do you want us to defer that? Two weeks, please. Thank you. Is that 412? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So is there a motion to defer 412 until? Uh -huh. Second. July 24th? Yes. Okay. What? Do we have to, add, yes. it to, <laughs> okay. we have to add it to the agenda first? Oh, it doesn't actually. Yeah, it's not actually here. <laughs> Yeah, they're not on the agenda yet. Well, if you restate your motion to add it to the July 24th agenda, that would be fine because we won't need to waive any rules, mm -hmm. suspend any rules. Do you accept that, Councilmember Rubingle? Yes. Yeah. And who is the second? Second. Do you I accept that? that? Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor of adding... C36412 to the July 24th agenda, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, thank you, council members. And the last one that I'm here to present is also a budget correction. This is to remove and decrease appropriation by 800,000 um, that was originally budgeted in the adopted budget and then also carried over in the encumbrance process. So we sanctioned it off into a reserve account, but now we're just formally asking you, and we waited for the mid-year process to ask you to, to remove that appropriation. Okay. Any further questions? questions? Uh, is there a motion to suspend the rules for purposes of adding these special budget ordinances to tonight's agenda? Or moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed, no. Any abstentions? All right, those are added. And just um, for anyone who's watching, all those special budget ordinances for public testimony, I'm going to put as one topic because they're all essentially mid-year corrections. So they're kind of related. Um, we'll vote on them separately, but we'll have that um, testimony if anyone has any testimony about 
any of those, they can do it all at the same time. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tanya. All right, so there's no emergency ordinances, and then moving on to resolutions and final reading ordinances. Uh, resolution 2023-0043 will be considered or under special considerations, item S1.B. And then the next resolution is 2023-0051, stating that the Spokane City Council's position on city staff serving in an interim capacity. And this will be you, Council President. And we've um, proposed several different versions of this. The most recent uh, was circulated by Jacoby Bird on July 6th. I'm looking for a motion to substitute that version. So moved. Second. Any discussion about the motion to substitute? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no? No. Any abstentions? Okay, it's substituted. And yeah, we've discussed this concept in a while, but this is um, a resolution uh, requesting that the mayor um, look at the positions that are currently interim and have gone past the allowable 180 day uh, time period without a council vote and either propose those uh, people who are filling those positions to be appointed into permanent positions or other people or appoint interims uh, that are eligible for uh, the first 180 days, essentially. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, so resolution 2023-0052, affirming Spokane Public Library and partner community organizations shall incur no costs associated with traffic control when closing down Spokane Falls Boulevard for events. And this is Council Member Zappone. And also, I'd ask too, um, last time uh, it was brought forward that the administration would also look at options working with those partner organizations. And we do have uh, Colin Tracy here to update the Council, if willing. Do you want me to go now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, Council. Uh, thank you, Garrett. My name is uh, Colin Tracy. I'm Policy Advisor to the Mayor. Um, yeah, so for, for this year, we did, um, I think we have a, a temporary traffic control solution uh, for, for the event out in front that will allow the uh, event later this August to take place in front of uh, the, the library at, on Spokane Falls Boulevard. Um, that will come at no cost to the organizers for this year. And uh, the, the city administration and streets are uh, committing to coming up with a more permanent plan um, going forward once the post street bridge opens up um, traffic control is going to be a lot easier uh, to to divert um, and streets and clint harris are working on a, a traffic study right now to help influence that plan um, yeah is yeah is there a, so i guess is the consideration to make permanent traffic changes that would allow events to take place more easily or is this just more of a, a planning process just a planning process okay yeah okay yeah go for it so i'm just curious and zach you and i've talked about this and i i don't know if we i brought this up so if i'm a an organization that's going to bring a special event not necessarily on spokane falls where that needs to be closed off closed off but in the park or Bloom's Day, something like that. And I have to pay for those services, traffic control. I'm sure that's part of what they have to look at. What do we say to those people? Do they, do they have to pay those fees? We do, this correct. Is very specific. Yeah. What? So, to, to the plaza, to the spoken They don't have plaza. to pay if they do it at the plaza, because that's how we designed that, Just to do for that. their special events. Do they have to pay yep. those fees? Yes, correct. For traffic control if mm -hmm. they're at the park? Okay. Correct, yeah. But they wouldn't if they were in the... Yeah. Well, the, we for, passed last year cost recovery that had a percentage for it. So, like, right. the big three, Bloomsday, Who Fist, yeah, I know that, Mylock, they were still... higher, 50%, where it went down um, to, to different rates. Okay. So, so 25% for other parades. Unless they're... Free expression events, then mm -hmm. it's capped at five hundred dollars. Do we do we have a sense of uh, what it takes at, at the present moment to actually shut that down and make it safe for events? 
Yes, we've got some estimates. I don't know how accurate they are. I've heard several different numbers okay. from Excelsior six dollars. grand to sometimes less. Um, a lot of that was personnel. If we're going to have, if we're going to have to have somebody doing traffic control, waving people on. So the 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 issue is going to be the intersection at Maine and Lincoln. Right. Um, so once we get the barriers up, that's where the backup's going to be. So you're going to have to have something there to move traffic along. So I was considering just a very tiny tweak uh, to this, but then I'd heard that there was some additional work being done, so I didn't bring it. But my, my one concern, uh, well, I guess there's a couple with the cost, but my other concern is that uh, the, the way that therefore is written is it's a little broad. And it, it, it kind of, it, when I read it, I, I read it as it could be, any event, any time of day, it, you know, it's not really specific to somebody working and coordinating with the library and that it, this is a planned, scheduled sort of event. I just think it should be specific to those sorts of events where the library is a partner, has a controlling interest in, in what's taking place, and yeah. that way they can have that management purview. Yeah, I'm, I'm not on the council. The, the way it was yeah. written was for it to be those partnering with the library. Okay. But I'm going to ask for a deferral for this. An indefinite yeah. interval. I think there was an agreement that once the administration came forward and said there's not going to be a charge for library events for this year and then next year after the post route bridge, there'll be other solutions. Council members opponents going to table this. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. it won't. But exactly, but the, the point of it is was exactly what you did is this is meant for this specific location when the library is sponsoring it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things council members opponents shared with me is uh, we've been unable to hire a traffic engineer technician to go adjust the light cycles. Mm -hmm. So that's the, how you do it without having a bunch of police as you change the light cycles at Lincoln going south to Maine and then you don't, you don't need police there. But we literally haven't been able to find that actual person yet. But once we have that person and we have Post Street Bridge, it, it should go pretty flawless. Yeah, should be a lot smoother. You want to bring your motion? Uh, yeah. Um, so I move to defer this indefinitely. Second. All right. Any discussion about the motion yeah. table? The, the other thing I say is I appreciate Colin working on this. It kind of just landed in your lap and trying to pull together a lot of different people to make that happen. I know event organizers will appreciate that too. Um, I think it's important to say that like, these costs were prohibitive for the library and others from doing any programming on that space at all. And so the goal is to have this an active space during the summer from Memorial Day to Labor Day through the weekends. And they were really finding that this is a prohibitive cost. Uh, I do think it, it, it's been frustrating that it took up into this point for that conversation to happen and to start. And it concerns me um, that the administration should be looking for these cost saving efforts in general and not just waiting until these last kind of pushes from council to say like, how are we gonna save our costs? So I just wanna Say that. All right, but it's great. We yeah. we spent a lot of money on that space and designed it just so this this could happen. And so it's pretty exciting to see that it's actually. And I'm really looking forward to this event. And also wanted to express my appreciation to Colin for um, jumping on this once he was tasked with it. So thanks. Thank you. Oh, but we didn't have the vote. Any other discussion about the vote to motion defer. to table indefinitely? Indefinitely. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Aye. Any abstentions? All right. All right. Thank Third you, Colin. Uh, resolution 2023-0053 and 0054 will be briefed by Council President. The first is approving the appointment of Kelly Thomas as the Manager of Sustainability Incentives for the Spokane City Council. And then the resolution 0054 is establishing the Municipal Criminal Justice Coordinating Subcommittee of the Public Safety <coughs> and Community Health Committee. All right. The first... Uh, on the exciting news that Kelly Thomas is going to be our new manager of sustainability initiatives. Um, we did a process, a uh, hiring process. We had two um, finalists uh, who were both very good. Um, we chose Ms. Thomas and under our new council uh, ordinance for central staff, it takes a resolution of at least four, a vote of four council members rather than just the council president, which was the previous rule. So. I'm essentially nominating Kelly Thomas to uh, be the new manager, and I'm looking for people's support later today. But to do that, I need a motion to substitute version, because we had a version with a blank. Now we have a version with her name inserted. Um, so moved. Second. All right, so moved and seconded. Any further discussion? 
All those in favor of the substitution indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. Any abstentions? All right, that is substituted. And then. Should I abstain? You don't need to abstain. No. You're losing your person. It's the opposite of a conflict yeah, of interest. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're like hurting yourself. Well, that, yeah. Then I won't abstain. Okay. okay. You certainly don't have to abstain from the substitution. Um, so, Resolution 54 is in establishing a new um, City Council subcommittee. This one, the Municipal Criminal Justice Coordinating Subcommittee uh, from the Public Safety uh, Committee. And we briefed this last, I don't know if it was last week or two weeks ago. Probably, probably two weeks two ago. ago. Um, but essentially, uh, this is a subcommittee that will assist the Council. Uh, with policy, and this particular design has half the members of subject matter experts, including a lot of people from the administration, including the police chief and the prosecutor, um, and um, many community members, including community members with lived experience of being incarcerated and being in the criminal justice system. Um, and um, this would just get, uh, city council would, um, select or choose the people who are going to be on it other than the subject matter experts in the resolution. And then the other thing it does, it also clarifies for all subcommittees that uh, the meetings of the subcommittee and any executive committee are open public meetings and will be recorded. Um, work groups that are ad hoc don't necessarily have to be um, recorded because um, they're more irregular. But there was a question before of whether subcommittees had to do that because they're technically not required to under the Open Public Meetings Act, uh, but the intent of council was that they treat themselves like they were. So, all right. Karen. Alrighty. The next three will be briefed oh, by I'm Abigail. Brief. I'm briefing them too. Oh, you're okay. Yeah, I am. <laughs> All right, perfect. So the first one is resolution 2023-0055, approving the installation of automated traffic safety cameras. Uh, the next one is resolution 2023-0056, and with the attachment of uh, ordinance 2023-0674 regarding allocation of funds from infractions issued with automated traffic uh, safety cameras. And then the third resolution 2023 for 00 Five seven is regarding the allocation of funds from infractions issued with automated traffic cameras for traffic calming measures. This is uh, a pretty comprehensive update. We usually do this yearly on traffic calming. The one piece that it does not do is decide how much money is going to be spent of our uh, balance of funds and income on specific projects. I will um, get to that. In a, in a moment, but we're not making that decision. Some people thought we were deciding which projects we are funding uh, tonight. We're not doing that. There's a whole bunch of new projects, but we'll get to that. But the first one is uh, installing uh, new traffic safety cameras. We went to the legislature and asked for permission to add traffic uh, <coughs> radar speed cameras uh, near parks and hospitals that needed them, not just near schools. We got permission to do that, and while we, and we surveyed all the neighborhood councils, all the schools, and all the hospitals, and asked for feedback of where they thought they were needed. Um, and we came up with a list and circulated it with police and streets. And this resolution would essentially um, uh, indicate that the city wants to establish these cameras in these locations uh, at the attached spreadsheet, although I'm going to ask in a moment to substitute because it left off one page in the packet. It left off District 3, not intentionally. <laughs> Council members of Pones on the committee, so <laughs> it, was, it was not. Um, but um, so what would happen then is that would be conveyed to American Traffic Solutions, which is our vendor, and they would uh, assess the sites to make sure that the camera technology and the locations would fit with their uh, equipment and processes. Uh, but then, assuming um, that would go, then those would get installed sometime next year, probably over the summer uh, in time for school uh, to be there. Um, the city, anyone, anyone near 300, within 300 feet of a school or school crossing 
the proceeds go to the city. Uh, the hospital and parks, which I think there's about um, five of those, uh, has to be split between the state traffic calming fund and that. That was what the legislature's condition for expanding that is. Um, so I'm looking for a motion to substitute the Exhibit A that was circulated earlier today to uh, Resolution 54. So moved. Second. Oh, excuse me, 53. No, 54. Yeah, 54. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of substituting the exhibit with the full list of locations, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. Any abstentions? All right. Um, okay, I'm sorry. That was for resolution 55. Okay. Council President? Yeah. So Abby's here. Does she, can I ask if she has anything to add? Well, she asked me if I would brief it, so. Okay, you don't have yeah, I'm not to keeping her. I'm not keeping her from... I Okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I just saw you sitting there and I went, I don't know if she needs to add anything or not. Okay. Nope. Um, uh, okay. 56? 56. 56 um, is uh, a specific spending resolution uh, related to the police department of a budget grant agreement, and it covers two different things that we've discussed uh, several times previously, but this just formalizes it going forward. And um, one of them is for the purchase and installation and then training of officers on 12 new types of uh, speed radar measuring devices that are installed in patrol cars and can measure speed of vehicles while they're moving and the patrol cars moving as opposed to the stereotypical officer stopped holding a radar gun out the window. So this can just give real-time data for anyone on patrol who has one, and we're starting with 12, and we're asking uh, for them to report back to council on the data that they receive on that to show whether it is worth the investment, uh, especially since they're not doing dedicated traffic patrols um, at this point. Yeah. Well, I got a call from Assistant Chief Lundgren concerned about that piece, which is the data. This was originally supposed to be a pilot, so I'm confused as to why there's a question about collecting data or what the data is. And I wonder if um, Major McNabb, could you address that at all? Because we do need data to know if it's working. That's the whole point of a pilot. And then if it is doing what we think it should do, then we order more. Yeah, those are those are great questions, Councilwoman. And um, just first off, this isn't new technology. I mean, this is stuff that state patrols had in their cars for decades, I believe, maybe a decade, a long time. Um, so this isn't some cutting edge technology that we're asking to purchase. This is just simply a means of adding another avenue for officers on patrol to easily enforce tra traffic control, especially speeding. Um, without having to put themselves out of service, as Council President described, standing on the curbside pointing a radar gun at, at, at the cars as they go by. They can observe this while they're patrolling or on their way to a call, um, this, this or that, and just uh, to supplement our ability to do traffic enforcement um, while we don't have staffing to staff a traffic unit. So as far as the data goes, that isn't really specific to the equipment we're trying to purchase. It's more specific to our dispatch and reporting um, software. So in order for us to gather that information with the equipment we have now, the software we have now, we would have to go through and manually look at each and every incident to mine that data out of there. Um, we're checking to see if there's an easier way to do that in the ticket reporting module, but right now we don't know of any, and um, Shauna Ernst is not aware of any way to get that data that was requested. Yes, sir. So I, I guess I'd wonder, are you guys in contact with the, the company that produces the devices to see if they've got some, some means or some additional type package that you could... You know, even if it costs a little bit more money that the, you could look into? The actual radar units? Just, yeah, so that yeah. the, the back end, you know, data collection aspect of it might be more robust if right. they have other products or... I, I, we could check on that. My, my you know, I, I don't have the intimate knowledge of what exactly what was requested. I think it was okay. council members of Palm, but we're looking at um, 
time of day, location, uh, demographics, all that information, I'm pretty sure I can say with a little bit of confidence that's not going to be collected with the radar device. That'd be collected with the uh, reporting yeah. modules that we use. So and that, that's my question. I circulated this earlier, but uh, the amendment that I had was demographic data of individuals with their final outcome, like were they engaged, did they get cited or arrested, and just the location time of when the devices were used to pull people over. Yeah. So that was my question is if you are pulling someone over, isn't there another record of that happening? There's a record in the dispatch module, and I'm starting to get into territory I'm not real super familiar with yet. We probably should have Shauna here to answer these questions, so take that with a grain of salt. But um, when we pull somebody over, there's a record that we pulled them over, the record that um, that we, you know, the license plate that we ran, maybe we ran a name, um, and the officer can enter in the call with, I issued a ticket with a code, or I didn't issue a ticket, and maybe or may not provide a reason why they didn't issue it. I issued a warning for what? Maybe they just say I issued a warning, maybe they say I issued a warning for speeding. So that, that information, that granular information is what we're gonna have trouble mining at a, at a high level, we'd have to go through incident by incident and pull those comments out and somehow then translate them into. So you couldn't just pull out issued ticket or issued warning? And we could, then how many people were stopped? So right now our codes are issued ticket or no report. Or no report, but. We don't have a warning given code. That would be something that the officer would put in the comment. Right. That yeah. would be. Okay, I'd like to know how many tickets. Yeah. I would. Uh, I would love to know how many tickets. I would like to know. Warning. Right. So yeah. you're wanting to know how many tickets are going to be specific to these actual radar devices. That's that's another challenge. How do we? I guess we identify which officers are driving the cars that are equipped with the devices, and then you know, with our car constraints, are, are, they're not going to be assigned to a specific officer who was driving the car that day. So then we have to match the car to the officer. I, it, I'm not trying to create a barrier here, but I'm just saying this, this is a lot of detailed information that we don't have a, a really good mechanism to gather right now. Are, are we able to issue tickets any other way? Because I'm just imagining if we just get all the universe of the tickets that were issued over a, a month, yeah, we can get you all the tickets easy. Yeah, yeah it's just one specific to to right. using that radar. I don't know that we can do that or not. That's what Shauna's checking. But are on. there any other ways to give tickets now, or do people do the? I didn't think they're doing the radar. Oh yeah, you can pace somebody. Um, okay. You know, then there's all all kinds of moving violations that you observe. Okay. So, um, I was just. I, I think, and this isn't specific to, to PD, but the city, uh, you know, data collection, I think, is something that we struggle with across the board in a lot of ways. I almost wonder if we shouldn't set up some sort of internal work group that's mm -hmm. just focused on how do we make our, our data collection and analysis uh, more robust, and that should include PD, that should include, you know, planning, that should include streets. I mean, every, everybody really should have some little hand in that to make sure that, that the systems that we invest in and that we have are meeting these needs to, to get us the, the information that we need. So that mm -hmm. might be something big picture that we need to work on. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear the challenge is then how will the department judge how successful this pilot program is? Do you have any, have you guys thought of any measurement that you can derive from this new tool? I'm wondering if, and I don't know, Councilwoman, mm -hmm. is if on the ticket module, which is a state wide system sector is what it's called um, is if in that module we can track how many radar tickets were written um, that would capture all of our radar tickets even though you know ones that use the the gun on mm -hmm. the side of the road but that might just give us we could look at last year and then compare it after we put them into use and see if there's an increase well, I'd be open to whatever y'all can start with to, to give us some type right. of feedback for your own benefit as well as to no, Will we I continue to fund these or not? I totally get it. Councilmember mm -hmm. pump. Yeah, I'm still struggling with not being able to provide data. So I'm wondering how is this different than, say, when a community member requested that the police start collecting data on transients, and mm -hmm. then the department was able to create a new way to track transient vandalism when that was done within a couple of weeks when a community member requested right. it. But when a council member is asking for data, 
on how we are going to allocate funding, uh -huh. we're just being told that is not really possible. Well, I, I'm not saying it's not really possible. What I'm saying today, today is in the conversation I heard this morning surrounding this topic is that we're not sure we can do that right now. There's not an easy way that we all know of that we can say, this is the lever and here's your data. And whether it's council or city uh, citizen, that's, I mean, those aren't mutually exclusive. I, it seems like council members requesting data should be able to figure that out and community members shouldn't be driving that too. So I don't know, I, I struggle with this. I still think we should adopt these and if the department wants to use these, then they should be providing the data that we need to judge if this is a su yeah. successful program right. of administering public dollars. We can get the data. It, the problem is, is how much labor are we gonna spend getting the data? Right, mm -hmm. so it, it's it's not that we can't do it, but I'm just saying there isn't an easy way right now that we've identified, and there, and Shauna is looking into it. So it's not no, it's just we don't know right now. The other piece of it is uh, we have previously funded some money from traffic calming for specialty patrols to uh, enforce racing in North Spokane, and the ask has been to expand it to not just racing, but directed patrols, I think is what we're calling them, for any kind of speeding around the city. So when it, we start getting in reports, I think Upriver Drive was one that we got that we could deploy in overtime uh, officers. And again, it would be very targeted. It's only, it's not for patrol officers. It's only if they're on what this specialty patrol. So there was $75,000 um, for that. So also wanting to get result, uh, data back on that. Um, as best able. And then the third one is, has to do with um, the allocation of funds uh, according to the neighborhood priorities. You might remember we had 29 neighborhoods and we invited them to give us their traffic calming problems. We had workshops in the fall with Shauna and then the engineers looked and get, provided potential solutions. Then we had follow-up uh, workshops with the engineers, fine-tuned that a bit. And now we have a long list of way more money than we have. Uh, and a lot of them could probably be fine-tuned either to save money or be more responsive to the neighborhoods. But we were trying to figure out um, a way to allocate the funds to, to start tackling that four-year list. And so this resolution um, uh, proposes a framework. It doesn't guarantee that every project that will get done either next year or in the next four years, but it talks about how to eat that elephant one bite at a time. So that's what that, it has a list of the projects in it, but it is not making the final approval. We're gonna get a report back from engineering and also from finance about how much money we'll have next year and um, come back to you with a resolution specifically for which projects will get constructed next year. So council president, don't we need, or sorry, we don't need to add an, an exhibit to 57. Not to 57. No. Um, but I guess I wanted to either offer an amendment or defer. I don't know if council members have an interest in deferring the um, agreement with Spokane Police until we can get more clarity around what data they could collect. Um, um. Let's do it. <clears throat> let's do it simultaneously. They, they know what our concerns are. Um, let's set some, some time limits when we can get some answers. I'd like to pass this so it gives them some impetus to give us answers. It's a pilot. What, we need answers. I am in support of the program. I would be interested in then amending but it. Let's just make sure that we're on top of it so we don't let it slide. I fear that we won't get the information if we're not clear at the beginning. Um, we're, we're clear we, about what we want. You're, okay, <laughs> go ahead. I just wanted to add, if I may, if it's okay, Council yeah, President, um, with the two different initiatives in that same resolution, um, we do have traffic overtime enforcement going on right now. If it's going to be deferred, we're probably going to have to halt that for the time being, just so you're aware. Well, then I would offer an amendment to amend it to the language that I circulated earlier that describes what data we would like to make it clear what data okay. might be part of that agreement. But understanding that they might not be able to provide it exactly the way I mean, maybe not written. the first quarter. Yeah. yeah. 
But this is for the next 18 months. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Are you making a motion? Yeah. Okay. I'll second. So the motion was to add the language to the okay. amendment that was circulated earlier, or to the agreement. And this is regarding re restate resolution yeah. 56. Mm -hmm. Uh, restate the language? Yeah, just, just what data specifically is being Yeah, it would say, so this would be in total what it says, not all of its new language, but it says SPD will report quarterly to the Public Safety and Community Health Committee or more frequently as may be practical as the following information for each quarter. The number of occasions when, this is first about um, the speed measuring devices. So the number of occasions when deployment resulted in officers engaging devices. So when it was, the measuring devices were used. The number of occasions when deployment resulted in issuance of warning, traffic citations, or arrest. Demographic data of individuals with the final outcome of the engagement, where they warned, cited, or arrested, and the location and time of a location and time of deployment. And then the, for overtime expenses, it would add SPD will report quarterly to the Public Safety and Community Health Committee, or more frequently as may be practical, as the following information for each quarter the number of hours overtime were used, the dates, times, and locations for when overtime shifts were used, the number of occasions that resulted in issuance of warning, traffic citation, or arrests, and the demographic data of individuals with their final outcome. Okay. okay. Any discussion on the amendment? Crickets. Just making sure. Is there more on the floor? Yeah. Okay. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. Any abstentions? Okay. Council President. Yeah. Real quick, as it pertains to the list of projects, I've seen a lot of consternation over uh, one in particular on Hatch. I don't know if you've seen some of the emails on that. And I'm just wondering, what's the message to them about, because I know you said it's not final, but what, so what's the, generally, how should they be thinking about yeah, the message should be one. I volunteered uh, Abby Martin. Uh, but, but basically, it sounds like, and I won't be here to be part of it, but it sounds like what's going to happen is that as we, find, as we narrow the list of what's going to be constructed next, um, we'll have a bit of a process of engagement with the engineers and the neighborhood councils of like, all right, is this, you know, before we actually design it and build it, or is this exactly how it's going to be? And so... Um, I, I don't know enough about that particular project to judge the merits of their concerns. Um, but there are some opportunities, I think, to fine-tune things that are, that, that are there. Uh, but we're not, essentially, again, the purpose of this was to identify the problem areas in each neighborhood uh, council district mm -hmm. and then um, come up with solutions engineering solutions that are mostly informed by engineers, but to the degree that there are engineering solutions that are slightly different than currently stated, it sounds like the engineers are open to it. Of course, they'll want to get paid to do it. Um, and we don't want to, what we don't want to do is, you know, every year some new person from that neighborhood decides to get involved and then we're rethinking in that. So we're, it's a balance between, hey, we had lots of publicity, we had lots of workshops, lots of public process, Let's get things done with, boy, there might have been something that someone didn't think about or there might have been changing conditions on the ground. So do we have a little bit of room? Yes, but it's not going to be wholesale. Everyone thinks they're a traffic engineer. They're going to do that. So that's the balance. But Abby Martin would be their contract person um, for now. I'm sure she's thankful. Along with the funding stream. Yeah, and there also go? has to be money. That, like that money. particular project, I don't know. I forget how much it costs and where it's going gonna, it's be, gonna to be. Most projects we only have $300,000 for, so it'll be a while. So there should be some chance for, if there's really good engineer, um, traffic engineering type of feedback, I think the city's open to it. All right. All right, moving, moving on, on <laughs> to the uh, next two resolutions for appointments. Uh, resolution 2023 <laughs> Five eight and then zero zero five nine will be briefed by Marlene Feist. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, council members. Um, as we discussed at the public uh, infrastructure and environmental sustainability committee in June, um, we are pleased to bring forward um, Dan Buller to serve 
as the Director of Engineering Services for the city and Marsha Davis as the Director of Integrated Capital Management. As you know, both are longtime employees serving our citizens well for um, close to two, two decades apiece. So um, I think you, you know them well and I am really excited to have you vote on them. All right, thank you, Marlene. Uh, the next ordinance, C36166, is vacating Perry Street between North Line of Hartson yeah. Avenue. And this will be briefed by Eldon Brown. Good afternoon. We originally had the hearing on this vacation back in January of last year. It was part of the Liberty Park expansion for affordable housing in that area up there. So it was a no-cost vacation, but we did have two or three conditions that went along with it. Primarily, they have to address the intersection there of Perry and Hartson. We need to do some closure work there along with some actual relocation of a catch basin at that intersection. So what they've did, we've come forward with the final reading with the understanding they're bonding for that actual vacation for doing the improvements. At this point in time, we have that bond in hand. So we're just going ahead to do the final reading so they can get going with construction on the project. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about it. And this is the Proclaim Liberty? Pardon me? This is Proclaim Liberty? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you, Eldon. Excuse right. me, sorry. Um, did we want to add the resolution 2023-62 at this time or wait till later? That's the one affirming legislative priorities for 2023 to 2024 session. Um, sure, we do want to add that. <laughs> we got that was the SRTC one. That yeah. just came up. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. I forgot about that. Can you uh, just state Red that top bridge. title? Um, yes, let me get it here. It's a resolution by Spokane City Council affirming the legislative priorities of the City of Spokane for 2023 to 2024 sessions of the Washington State Legislature. Okay, great. And again, we discussed this briefly at Urban Experience, but this would add uh, seeking funding for the Leita Creek Bridge project uh, over $60 million to our 2023 uh, legislative agenda. Uh, so that uh, we can then provide that proof to SRTC that we have made an official statement and priority of this in hopes that they will add that to their uh, unified regional project list. But I need uh, a motion to suspend the rules to add that resolution to tonight's agenda. So move suspension of the rules. Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor of suspending the rules indicate by saying aye. 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 Any aye. Pose no, any abstentions? All right, the rules are suspended for purposes of adding uh, this resolution. Is there a motion to add this resolution to the agenda? Motion to add. Second. All right, any discussion on the motion to add? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Aye, aye. aye. any opposed no? Aye. Any abstentions? All right, that is added. Thank you. All right, thanks, so ordinance uh, C363 uh, eight nine is considered under special considerations. Item S one A ordinance C three six three nine one will be under hearings. Item H two and then C three six three nine two will be considered under hearings. Item H three and the next ordinance will be C three six four zero zero related to park uh, parking and municipal code amendments to the SMC sections and this will be briefed by Luis Garcia. Thank you, Council President, members of the Council. Uh, this ordinance uh, was intended to adopt electric vehicle charging station um, provisions, so similar to disabled uh, parking stalls, that it would uh, uh, make sure that, ensure that the uh, correct parker is in that, in that stall and have a penalty if not. Uh, the other item was a, a housekeeping um, item for golf cart decals. Um, the, there is a, a program for that. It was inadvertently taken out of a previous Cotex amendment. So it was intended to get put back, and there was a, an amendment on the on the table as well. Is there a motion to substitute a version, or is the current version? And anyone know? 
the meeting. Does this have, Councilmember Cathcart, you had some languages. Your yeah, language. we already amended already did it. mine okay. last week. Yeah. Okay, great. So, so, you know, so I, I don't know if it's an appropriate location. So, um, you know, s staff would not uh, be in favor of, of that, uh, that amendment. So if there's uh, further questions, I'd love to have the opportunity to ask them or answer them. Yeah, and we didn't have a chance to get into the details last time, but but yeah, in, in full disclosure, uh, um, we and we've had this conversation in the past, staff is not supportive of the amendment. Um, and I don't know if you guys recall, but, and Chris had helped me um, put that amendment together, but basically it just said that uh, an error, a user error could be a defense uh, from a, essentially a parking ticket. And that was something that used to be the case and it got changed uh, in the last few years. And so I was trying to put that back. So why would staff be against it? So whenever we're um, uh, patrolling for the, to ensure that the correct car is being parked in the correct stall that they're, they intended to pay for, we, um, we uh, stood up a whole new program from you know, scanning a license plate so there's not data entry errors on our staff's behalf. So now we scan the, uh, the Department of Licensing's plate to make sure that that, that is gonna be the plate that's, that's the lawful um, license plate number. So if that uh, license plate is not entered correctly into, for example, the mobile payment app, then that vehicle is gonna come up to say, hey, that vehicle didn't pay for parking. Because that vehicle didn't pay for parking, it was, it, it, for whatever reason, whether it be a zero versus an O, um, it, is a common thing. But that's also um, a, a concern for really abuse of the system to kind of skirt the time stays as well. So that was our uh, staff's concern, is that it basically makes patrolling impossible because we wouldn't know if there's a data entry error we would just know that that vehicle that was in that physical location did not pay for parking um, further because we issue the citation it goes to the adjudication process which has a cost associated with it so if it's a, if it's dismissed that cost still carries but it would be uh, again a cost that would be dismissed and have to be absorbed by the fund when there wasn't a, uh, a municipal error the municipality had uh, performed um, the way it was, it was intended to. And I'll just, my only rebuttal to that is simply that I just think that we should be as, as friendly to our customers and our citizens as we can, and, and I just think a user error, uh, a minor user error, when they have actually put money in the machine or, or put money into the app, uh, we should do everything we can to make sure that they're not getting blindsided with a ticket, so that's my feeling. Yeah, and, th and that is something that, uh, that I also uh, would like to state that staff is trained to if they if there is like the zero uh, for an O is is a common one the the uh, five for an S is another one that that's that's commonly missed. So if we are in the process of issuing a citation, we see those types of, of uh, numbers in there. We will go and try to enter in that one manually in just to switch that one digit to ensure that 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 wasn't what happened. So we do go through somewhat of a check, but uh, when they're out there again utilizing the technology, so there's not a municipal data entry error, it pretty much uh, is, is going to slow that process down and be costly to an already stressed fund. So. Is that going to be, that's not going to be part of this? It is. It, it is. We, we it amended is. it last week. We did it last week. Okay. So the current version. Yep, includes. The current the version current errs version. in favor of the customer. Okay. Is the current version. So. Okay, thank you. I would add it's incumbent upon the parking person to prove their case to the judge. It's not automatic. Yeah. You know, they have to go in front that's of the, correct. in court and actually present uh, evidence that they made a, made a mistake. It's not going to be incumbent upon the department to figure, you know, to solve that problem for him. Hmm. Correct. All right, thanks Louise. Thanks. I'm gonna skip ahead just so that we can get our um, testimonial signups done to ordinance C36405 concerning parking regulations for housing exempting minimum parking space requirements. Were we gonna defer that for two weeks? Is that, or one, one week, week, sorry. So the issue was that SEPA didn't go out in time, that the hearing could close before today's vote. So we need to defer it for a week. No. Or is it already deferred or, to the 17th? I would request a deferral, Council President, until the 24th, since yeah. we have a town hall yeah. on the 17th. Oh, okay. Isn't it on the 17th already? It is already on the agenda for the 17th. So, and I would request a deferral till the 24th. I know. The problem and is he's gonna be gone. I, and Council Member Bingle will also likely be gone due to yeah. his well, leave, so. I would prefer that the two sponsors be able to vote on it at the town hall Can't next you week. Call in? Probably not. Okay. 
It's, I mean, if both sponsors are gone, I get it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's challenging. <clears throat> it, I, yeah. Uh, for the record, sorry, jumping in. Yes. Sorry. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I'll be able to virtually, yeah, sorry, I'll be able to virtually join either the 24th or the 31st. Um, and so I, I would be, uh, I, I will be in attendance on those days. That makes sense. Just virtually. But I guess my point is it already is on the 17th, right? It's, no, it's, it's on the 10th, and yeah. this will oh, be a motion not, to defer it. Okay. Right. Yeah. I see. Sorry. It would be a limited agenda for the 17th. It would be basically one item for the 17th, plus the council president stuff. And the, well, and the town hall. Though. Yeah, with 10. Is it 10 but, neighborhoods? Well, yeah, right now it's on the 17th. No. It, no. We're, no. It's, it's on, on today. The They're asking to move it to the 17th. It's on the advance. It's on the advance. Yeah. advance, it's on the 17th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which on the advance, it's almost the only thing on the advance. That's I would prefer to be able to vote okay. on it. <laughs> not the 31st. Um, You're not big on, uh, yeah, so big on those. Did you make your motion? Uh, I moved to defer those to next week, the 17th. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of uh, deferring Ordinance 36405 until July 17th from tonight, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Any abstentions? All right, that's deferred. All right, now back All right. to you. Jumping back up to Ordinance C36401 relating to the sales and use tax of housing and housing related supportive services. This will be briefed by Nicolette Alcaltree. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, this ordinance is amending the sales and use tax for affordable housing and housing supportive services section of the SMC. Did you guys want me to go over some of the proposed changes or answer any questions? I know that we're on a time crunch. I have no questions. No okay. questions. Nope. All right. Thanks for your work on that, Nicolette. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So now in the next uh, two, ordinance C36402 relating to the establishment of process to consider and act upon community members' concerns regarding city-owned property, uh, and C36403, establishing the motto of the City of Spokane and adopting a new section in the SMC, will be briefed by Alex Gibrigisco. Thank you, Garrett, and <laughs> sorry, Alex. <laughs> you're you're totally Tongue-tied over here, sorry. Good afternoon, Council. Yeah, so this uh, first ordinance is briefing an ordinance relating establishing of the process to consider and act upon a community member's concerns regarding city-owned properties. This was presented at the May Urban Experience Committee, the June Human Rights Commission, and briefed uh, June 25th. Uh, any questions? Okay. Did Council Member Cathcart have And the second ordinance, um, it's an ordinance establishing the motto to in Spokane we all belong and adopting a new section to the code. Um, this was presented at the June Urban Experience Committee and the March meeting for the Equity Subcommittee and Human Rights Commissions and briefed June 25th. Questions? I know you had some yep. Potential amendments, which I, have. I don't love, but go ahead, tell us about them. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I uh, bring one, one amendment forward and uh, basically identifying this as our provisional motto, uh, uh, essentially the motto that would be kind of there until there is an officially adopted one. And essentially what it would say is that the process would include a, either, well, it could be both, but a six month public engagement process uh, or uh, a vote on a public ballot as just as an advisory uh, an advisory vote and the reason for this I think in my mind and I my colleagues certainly can disagree is you know we adopted a flag uh, just recently and that was around a two-year process that involved a lot of community members uh, a lot of meetings a lot of discussion and at the conclusion of that process there was actually a public uh, vote it was it was democracy in action folks took a vote and they decided which flags they liked and and that process narrowed it down to the flag we picked. And that wasn't one that I uh, necessarily voted for, 
Um, but I'll tell you, I've, I've come to really appreciate it, um, especially knowing that just how much went into uh, that, that flag. And so my, my consideration here is that we really just have not done something on the same level for adopting a city motto. And I think the motto and the flag, I mean, that's kind of like on the same level of representation of the city. It's what people think of when they think of your city. And so in my mind, we should have some engagement before we make it official. Uh, I don't have any issues with the motto as written, but I want that buy-in. I want that feedback from the community before we say this is official, this is going to be our, our motto from here on, here on out. And I think it would also lend itself to preventing a future council from just <coughs> simply changing it. I think um, when you just kind of put it in real quick, it's easy to put something else in real quick. And I don't want to see a back and forth. I want to see something that we all just agree on and we can unite around and support. And so that's the purpose behind uh, this amendment is uh, really to just get us to that point. And in the meantime, this would be our provisional temporary motto until that were to uh, take place. Second. <laughs> Second, he said. <laughs> yeah. So here's, Go ahead. This is the only, this is what confuses me. I do agree. I think we need some public feedback would be great or some input. But it seems to me, and do not talk to each other. Oh, I'm sorry. It seems to me that when, with a new administration, um, there's always that logo or that motto that comes in, right? I mean, we started, I, I don't remember what choice. it was. City of choice, near nature, near perfect. What's this one now? You're Creative you're confusing nature, your mottos, yeah. but so uh, you're, the Visit Spokane motto was, near nature, near perfect, and then creative by nature. Okay. The city of choice, that was um, our motto. Mayor Condon just promulgated it. He didn't go through any process. Correct. He didn't have human rights commission or anything, but yeah. But it, it changes with administrations. And so I don't, I, I'm confused about how do you make this, is it gonna change the, when a new administration No, because comes in? this would be or an ordinance. And it would, we would have to keep this. Until a council changed it. So a mayor could come to the council and say, hey, we want to change it. But, but this, would, this would take it out of one person um, <coughs> saying it to... Saying the, what it is. Yeah. Okay. I would just, I would appreciate more if we could get more public feedback. That's my only comment. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. So there has been community engagement around this. It may not be to all the groups that everybody wants to have community engagement, but we had our training. Um, it went through the sub-equity, it's been through the human rights, it's been out there in other organizations. If you drive through our city, you will see we all belong on some of our school boards. So it is not a term or a phrase that is like unknown to anyone. I will say it is a big deal in the Association of Washington Cities. Uh, most municipalities have adopted we all belong uh, going forward as an umbrella to their cities. But cities do evolve, and you know, it might change. We might be in a place where we feel we've accomplished where we all belong, and we're looking for something different. So I support it as it is. Can we then, if adopted, can we then look at the strategies of how we make people all feel belong going forward? That would be a challenge I would have to us. Councilmember Mingle. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, like, or to reiterate what Councilman Cathcart said, is that, you know, this is something that, again, is going to be the statement that's made. Um, I don't agree with different administrations coming in, saying, you know, whatever they want, making, you know, their own motto. Um, uh, you know, and I don't, I don't necessarily agree with, you know, new councils coming in and creating a new motto all the time. So. I think Councilmember Cathcart's amendment makes a lot of sense of like establishing, okay, we can change the model, we can establish the model, we can change the model. There just needs to be a process. That way it doesn't change all the time. Um, yeah, again, same thing with our flag. It is something that's going to represent the entire city. And um, so I think, you know, a, a good amount of community engagement seems to make sense um, on, on getting, uh, you know, some different options and then maybe narrowing them down to a few different options and putting that out for, uh, you know, a vote uh, to the people, something like that seems to make a lot of sense to me, especially since it's going to be something that uh, people from Spokane, um, that's what's said on their behalf. So I think, I think the, uh, the added engagement makes a ton of sense. 
Council Member Zappone. Yeah, I'm not going to support the amendment. I, um, I, I definitely agree with like outreach and, and all, but I don't know how much outreach was done with near nature, near perfect. And that seems to be one that resonated with a lot of people. It was done for marketing. And uh, unlike a flag, I think if a flag is a great marketing tool itself, but I think flags have a, a whole different level to them than mottos do. And uh, I, I agree that a flag needs a, a more thorough process than a motto. I think a motto represents the values at the time, and that can change when those values change or what the needs are at that time change. Um, this creates a formal process where we can change it in the future if needed. Um, but I, I, I don't think that the outreach should stop. I think that we should continue. And if people disagree with that, then we change it. And I'll just speak. Obviously, I'm a big sponsor of this and I'm hoping that we can pass it tonight. Um, I have, we have been talking about belonging for a couple of years out there in the community. Uh, and I haven't heard anyone who is opposed to it. I haven't heard any arguments against it. One of the things that I was attracted to about belonging is that it really crosses so many divisions and groupings in uh, a lot of the work to try to repair relationships and past um, problems. It can feel divisive in trying to heal it and remedy it. And um, to me, there's something about the word belonging that transcends that. And I think everybody, regardless of their lived experience, has experienced a time when they didn't belong and they've experienced when they did. And so I, I, just, I think it's really powerful. I, I totally agree that we should uh, take up Spokane Arts on their offer to help lead a campaign of getting the word out there and to Council Member Wilkerson's points and many points of other community members who have given feedback. There's been a lot of feedback about it. The main feedback is how do we make it real? And so I think that is the conversation. So I'm going to oppose the amendment, but, uh, you know, only, I totally take it in, in good faith, and I'm not opposed to anything that Councilmember Cathcart said, but I would just like to say this is what we already passed a resolution that we were a city of compassion. I think Councilmember Stratton did this. Belonging is kind of the next evolution, but the, the difference would be we would say we all belong or in Spokane, we all belong, but it, it does not require it to be on stationary or anything like that, and it gives us a chance <coughs> to flush it out and do that engagement, and then if it needs to be tweaked a little bit to really capture, then we can. And I, and I would just, just to respond, I would say I, I, I have not heard any real pushback on, on the, the motto, and, and, and frankly, I, I have no inherent issues with it as written. Uh, I just want to make sure that there's that buy-in and it, it, people feel like they had a, a part to play in, in deciding what this would be since we haven't had a historical other than the, the Visit Spokane mottos. <coughs> so that, that's really the, the intent. One last quick question. Yep. Council Member Wilkerson, mm -hmm. um, Association of Washington Cities, you said that many of the cities are, so are these city, other cities actually adopting this as their motto? Yes. So other cities will be in Tacoma, we all belong. In Tacoma, we all belong, yes. Okay. They're, they have the word, be, it may not be in Tacoma, we all belong, but the word belonging is part of, is their, part of their models, yes. Okay. It, and there's been some cities, like I think Sammamish, also mm -hmm. use it kind of in their branding of like usage of parks and things like that. Thank you. All right, there is a motion on the table to amend. Uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Oh, I got excited. Aye. Oh. Okay. <laughs> three, three eyes. All those opposed, no? No. No. Any abstentions? All right. The amendment does not carry. All right. Continue all. So someone we can at least get a drink before 6 o'clock. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, Ordinance C36404 is adopting policy standards of broadband infrastructure expansion. This will be briefed by Eric Finch. Good afternoon, Council, and this is the, the last one, I think, so I'll be, I'll be quick. Uh, this is, a, as, as briefed in the, in the last committee, uh, establishing both the, the policy goals as well as some of the hard goals for what we're trying to achieve through the program, and we would appreciate your support. I just wanted to thank Eric and Laz and the team and our 
um, consultant, Mr. Perret, and, and Steve McDonald for all the work on this. I feel like we're really uh, getting someplace, and Council Members Wilkerson and Cathcart have been working on this as well. And there's a lot of money and a lot of potential uh, policy choices coming down the road. And what's different uh, at this time and place is that Spokane is leading in that space rather than just reacting to it. And I think it's really going to benefit us and the entire community. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. And you were not the last one. So we're going into first reading ordinances, uh, C-364. 07 concerning the use of automated traffic safety cameras extending the termination date for authorization to use automated traffic safety cameras and and this is just a technical thing to extend us using it and we anticipate that we'll be signing an amended contract with ATS as well to do that so. all right so perfect now uh, special considerations s1 a and b Final reading ordinance of C36309, or sorry, excuse me, 389, submitting a ballot proposition to the voters. And this is briefed by Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, and I would uh, make a motion to substitute uh, C36389 for the version of C36389 that was circulated earlier today via email. Um, well, that, that's the motion, then I can go into the details. If there's a second. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion and second. Uh, so the biggest changes, and we've, we've talked about just, you know, this is a, a, a change to the charter, and it would obviously go to the voters for uh, de determining whether or not they want this change, if, if the council agrees, to send it to them. Uh, and, and so really there's a number of changes that it makes. It repeals the existing redistricting chapters and replaces it with a new one. Uh, and so the changes in the substitution from what we've previously briefed, uh, the biggest changes are that instead of the plan commission being the, the uh, department that would be sort of in charge of, of uh, seeking out the um, applications and potentially determining the seventh non-voting chair, that would actually fall to the community assembly, which uh, after some, some conversation with council members around whether the plan commission was the right entity to do that, you know, I really started to think about, well, my goal in this is separating the politics from this process as much as possible, and the community assembly is far more independent than, than the plan commission or anything else that's appointed by, by council and the mayor. And so this seemed to make a lot of sense, and I think the community assembly has become pretty integral in our community, and to have them play this, I think, important role would, would be a very big boon to them uh, as an entity as well. And then the other major change, and there's a lot of little cleanup, some superfluous language that was taken out that that just re and so we can reference state law uh, instead of needing to include this in the charter. Uh, and then the last change is if there is a uh, citizen led effort to do a mid decennial redistricting plan, which has traditionally been authorized uh, at the count uh, councilmatically through our charter, this would allow the citizens to do it. And if they were to pursue that instead of a 1% signature threshold to qualify, this would match it with the current uh, initiative threshold, which is 5%. So it'd be a higher bar um, to, uh, to get that through. And then if council wanted to do it on their own, mid-decennial, so five years in, uh, it would require five votes. Uh, that was the other change uh, instead of four. So, um, and those are kind of the major changes from the, the previous briefings that we've had on this. And we can obviously discuss this in more detail tonight if, if there's a desire to do so. So the first is a motion to substitute. Um, any further discussion on that? Council Member Zippo. Yeah, so Council Member Cathcart and I had a good conversation last week. I appreciated the adoption of some of the things that I suggested, um, increasing it to 2%, appreciate that. Um, I still have a lot of concerns around the community assembly sure. getting involved in this process. I don't think um, that redistricting should involve another entity that could wrap them into a political process and could be weaponized against them. Uh, I have a lot of concerns about that. What we're basically asking them to do is just basic qualifications around, does a person live in Spokane? Are they a registered voter? Have they not been a registered lobbyist? And um, that they're not gonna campaign? I don't know if we need an outside entity to do that. I think it just gets another group involved that could become very damaging to them um, and from my past experience, I think the fewer people that get involved, the better it is for those people. Sure. Um, so I, I don't support community assembly uh, getting involved. And then there were some things I still um, haven't come to agreement with overall. 
I do appreciate a larger commission. I think that's really helpful. But I still have a concern when it's just uh, three from the mayor and three from city council. I think we had a philosophical difference. I appreciated mayor appoint, council confirm. I thought that brought more buy-in from both sides. Uh, council member Cathcart kind of believed the two should have separate, more in independent yeah. philosophies that kind of battle it out. And so it was just a philosophical difference between those two. Um, so I, I, overall, I'm not supportive of this as it's written, and, um, but I do appreciate the changes. So yeah. I will support the changes for now, sure. but I would, I'll, I'll have another motion. I appreciate that. Um, two, two things uh, uh, on the community assembly. I mean, I think the other piece too, and I think it actually said seek, but the idea is to, to they wouldn't just collect applications, but they would also seek them out. So there'd be a little bit more of a proactive role, I think. Um, but, but also uh, the more important piece, or not more, but, but equally important, is uh, the, the, that they could potentially play that role of deciding the non-voting chair or the seventh um, person to kind of lead the, the committee. Because when this happened at the county uh, just last year, obviously that went to the county commissioners. And, you know, it, it kind of creates this inherent per perception that there's a bias in the process since the commissioners who could potentially benefit from, from, you know, certain decisions are the ones making that decision. I just, just want to kind of keep pol politics and politicians away. And so my, my, the entire, like, purpose is to just try and create that distance. And so, um, obviously, if, if this uh, charter amendment uh, does not go through tonight, uh, we'll go back to the uh, drawing board and trying to figure out how to do that. But... To me, it's really important that that be uh, a goal, is that we, we separate the politics from, from this process as much as possible. Any other discussion before we vote on the substitution? Hearing none, all those in favor of the substitution indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no? Any abstentions? Aye. Are, right, it is substituted. And then <coughs> I had a question for Council Member Cathcart about, about it. Would you be interested in a deferral again to still work out details, or would you rather it go to a vote tonight? I'm, I'm open to a, to a <coughs> deferral. I'm, I'm certainly open. I mean, obviously, within reason, because there's right. limited time. Right, but right, right. yes. Yeah. Not, Not next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Someone you guys can might. discuss that in the short time between Well, I'll just make a deferral for two weeks then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So to the 24th? To the 24th. So okay. I move to defer it to the 24th. Okay. All right. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions. All right. I don't have to vote on it. <laughs> All right. Now moving down into hearings uh, H1, A, and B is a hearing regarding proposed initiative 2023 4, and then B is the first reading ordinance C36408. And this is Terry. This is the hearing on proposed initiative 2020. 3-4 petition signatures filed on behalf of Brian Hansen, petitioner regarding prohibiting encampments near schools, parks, playgrounds, and child care facilities. Pursuant to SMC 2.02.080 and Section 84 of the City Charter, at the hearing on the petition, the City Council determines whether to grant the petition and pass the measure as requested, accept the petition but decline to pass the measure as requested, and direct the City Clerk to validate the signatures or to propose an alternative measure to either be adopted by the City Council or submitted to the voters of the City Council's own motion. In the past, for citizen initiatives, the City Council directs the City Clerk to validate the signatures. If the Council selects this option, I would deliver the petition signatures to the County Elections Office. The County Elections Office anticipates starting the validation process on Thursday, July 13, and completing the process on July 19. 2,624 signatures are needed and the county will stop counting once they get at that point or, or a little bit over. And at the hearing, the initiative ordinance has provided a first reading. Okay. Any question? Keep going. All right, thanks, Terry. Um, H2 and H3 will be briefed by Amanda Beck. The, uh, H2 is the final reading ordinance of C36391 related to the regulations of short-term rentals. And then H3 is a uh, final reading ordinance of C36392 related to fees on short-term rentals. Good evening, Council. Um, mostly, I just wanted to double check with you if you would like a presentation tonight, uh, given the agenda. 
<laughs> fair, totally fair. Just thought I would ask. No. <laughs> All right. Um, we have. Some... Thank you. Thanks for the offer. Uh, but we did. Uh, we have substitutions on H two and H three <laughs> that Mr. Wright circulated today. Um, the H two one. That was yours, right? Maybe you could tell us what the substitution for H2 was. H2, uh, the change was just in one paragraph in the version that was originally filed. There was a requirement that when you submitted an application for a permit that you attested to the fact that you had been permitted the whole time you were operating. Okay. We struck that and instead with legal came up with some language to provide that if you were permitted lawfully, you know, before the effective date of this, you get a credit going down the road for three years um, for each permit that you have. You know, so if you apply for a permit next year, you'll get a credit for what you paid in the past and uh, the year after that and the year after that. And we did that in lieu of forcing people who haven't been permitted to pay some kind of penalty or read it. So it was, there were so few people permitted compared to how many people are unpermitted that it was cheaper and easier to just give a refund or a credit actually to those people than to try to chase after the other people. So, okay. um, and then on H3, there's just a small substitution that the fund that's created from the platform fees for affordable housing to try to remedy some of uh, the impacts of changing rental housing into short-term rental housing um, would, um, 90% of it has to be used for actual affordable housing and up to only 10% can be used for administration. Um, and I think on H3, you have a yeah. amendment. I, yes, I've got an amendment. Um, just pulling that up here. Um, that's why. Wrong phone. Before you do that, let's there. substitute H2 and H3 and then we'll take okay. your amendment to the substitute. All those in favor, or is there a motion to substitute so H2 and H3? Okay, so moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. Any abstentions? Okay, now, concerning the H3 substitute version. Yeah, so this would create a new section, uh, 17C316100, um, and since the, the rules are suspended, I'm gonna slightly tweak this based on um, what legal has suggested. Uh, and that is the, the change would be, quote, for each short-term rental that converts to a long-term rental for a minimum of three years, the city shall be authorized to provide an incentive equal to permit fees paid under this code for a maximum of the prior three-year period of permit fees actually collected. Um, the intent being trying to create an incentive to, and this is a small incentive granted, but an incentive to encourage uh, folks to convert their short term to long term because ultimately, big picture, that's what we need to we need to see more of. So, what about if they sell their home? Is there an incentive to selling their home? To sell their home for for the small amount of fees that they would be collecting. I don't know if there would be, if that would be a big, I don't know, incentive to them. But I mean, we could. Certainly that's future. something we could yeah. figure um, out. <clears throat> so my question is, yeah. where does the money come from? It would be from the, P the fees paid in. So essentially, the, we don't technically refund, but it would essentially be a refunding of the amount of fees they paid in in that three year so period. Do you have a sense of what that would be? So if it's- I mean, it depends how active of a short term rental it is, I suppose. If it's $4 a night, yeah. you know, you just kind of have to do it the varies, math on that. In other words, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Member Stratton. So does staff could, does staff weigh in on an amendment like this? Uh, we did. I, Council Member Cathcart and I had talked a little bit about this. Okay. Um, to be clear, my understanding of we were talking about the permit fees, not the four dollar per night fee. Okay. And I think the language that legal uh, provided actually specifies permit fees. Um, at this point, we hadn't really considered. Uh, a refund of the four dollar per night fee, and as far as I know, we wouldn't really have a good way to track that because um, that's submitted by the operators. So that would be Airbnb or VRBO that actually submits that for all 
properties that they you know rented out over the I think it's every quarter that they would be submitting. So I'm not sure that that's um, as easily tracked as the permit fees. Uh, but Councilmember Cathcart and I had talked a little bit about some of these. So you my intent was the the, the four dollar a night because ultimately the the like licensing fees and stuff like that you're still going to be paying whether it's short term or long term and so I just that to me didn't make sense that you would refund that but the the four dollar a night the specific to the short term rental to me that was the intent of of my amendment. Yeah, that was a misunderstanding on my part, I suppose. But, yeah, no, um, no worries. So do you want to proceed with that now, or do you want to come back and amend the statute ordinance later? Yeah, with statute? some of the feedback, I'll just, I'll withdraw and bring okay. an amendment later okay. at the 6 o'clock. Okay. Councilmember Bingo. Yeah, I was just going to gonna ask, because I think I was having a hard time understanding what fees were going to be funded on this. Sorry. Well, I, so for Councilmember Cathcart, he's withdrawing his amendment for now because we need to clarify that. Yeah. The intent was the $4 a night, but we'll get it clarified. All right. We said, I, I need to go back to C36405, which was the parking regulations, and uh, I was reminded by text that it also says we needed to substitute a version, or do we need to substitute a version? I think so. Okay. Which one? All right. Well, if it turns out we do, we can do it on the night. Okay. The parking yeah. minimum? There, there is a substitute version that was placed in the packet. I don't know if you want to do that now or do it on the 17th. I would do it. Do it now. <laughs> I don't know what it's. That's one we're deferring now, right? Yeah. What is the yeah. substitute version? Well, Seventeen. Does anyone know what the subs? Uh, let's just. There could be a substitution to add a recital about SEPA, uh, uh, which is not earth-shattering, uh, but legal recommended. Okay. Um, I don't have the language uh, okay. prepared yet to do that. So, so let's just it would be a substitution. Right. Kind of a technical one next week. Okay. All right. Next week, you guys will remember? Uh, next week. Terry will remember. <laughs> All right. Almost done. All right. Okay, we are done. We're done. Yep. We're never done. All right. But now we have the advance briefing. <laughs> no, we've done it all. No, we didn't do the advance briefing. Yeah. They're all, all the ones we've talked about. No? There's a consent the agenda. Consent. Don't do the consent agenda. Did you want to didn't approve the agenda as it was amended since it was Oh, we do have to do week. that. Yeah. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda as amended? So moved. Second. In discussion, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? All right. Tonight's agenda is approved. All right. Consent agenda. Consent agenda on the advance for the 17th. Uh, number one is the purchase from uh, DNL Supply Company for the sewer and stormwater access frames and covers. Briefing this will be Mike Loudon. Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> sewer access frames and covers, sewer and stormwater access frames and covers uh, to be purchased uh, by wastewater from DNL Foundry, who was the low bid at $95,375 plus tax. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks for sitting through our whole meeting. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, number two is the value blankets for special asphalt products, A and B. This will be briefed by Clint Harris. Good afternoon, Council President and Council. Uh, so the Street Department is requesting uh, value blanket approval for the purchase of Nouveau Gap from special asphalt products not to exceed $80,000 using state contract 07121. And for item B, 2B, the street department is requesting value bl blanket approval for the purchase of SA Premier Gap sealant from special asphalt products at a cost not to exceed $125,000. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Clint. Uh, number three is a public works agreement with Aero Concrete and Asphalt uh, Specialties for an emergency sinkhole repair in the Spokane Police Department Northeast Precinct parking lot. Briefing this is Dave Steele, but I do not see Dave 
online or in the audience? You can do it next week. You can do it. <laughs> Number four, the acceptance of a grant uh, funding for the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. Briefing this is Major McNabb. Hello again, Council. This is a grant we've been participating in since 2008. It is an award of $294,191 for a two-year period, providing salary and benefits for one detective to be dedicated to investigating vehicle theft cases. All right. Thank you, Major. Number five is a two-year contract with Applied Industry Technologies for as-needed purchases. This will be briefed by Chris Avert. Good afternoon, council members. Today I'm seeking approval for a two-year contract with Applied Industrial for as-needed purchase and installation of conveyor belts. Uh, these are used at the Waste Energy Facility to transport ash. This contract is not to exceed $210,000. Any questions? Thank you. All right, and the rest of the consent are just blanks to be filled in. Uh, as far as the legislative agenda for Next week, we have briefed everything on here, so I'm now looking for a motion to uh, approve the agenda as read and written and adjusted. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 All, any opposed, no. Any abstentions? The agenda is approved. And that will be it. So you have a little bit of time. We'll see you at 6 o'clock. We're adjourned.